Welcome back to Behind the Play. My name is Alex Adams, and I am excited to be joined by one of the hosts of Hockey Night in Canada uh, for the second time, the the one and only David Amber of Sportsnet. Now we're colleagues, which is kind of cool to say as well. But uh, David, how how is everything going with the start of the season? Uh, so far, so good, Alex, and and congratulations. It's nice to call you a teammate as well as a friend, and um, glad things are going well for you professionally. And yeah, the season's got off to a pretty quick start. It's been pretty. Um, Listen, we're only two weeks in, but there's a lot of storylines, a lot of excitement, a lot of question marks surrounding some different teams and players. So makes for always something good to talk about. And it's so far so good. Do you have a bit of like the the summer itch, like sometimes in August where you're like, oh my God, I just need it to, to come. And then it all of a sudden happens and you're like, oh my God, this is kind of the rushes back. No. <laughs> not at all i don't know about you i like the summer i mean listen i love the job but i've been the summer it's like there's family time there's golf there's good weather Okay. uh you know biking hanging out doing different things so i've never yeah, in the middle of august i'm not sitting there going oh man i just can't wait to be in a studio till one in the morning on a tuesday night no i don't feel that way even though I, when i am in the studio one o'clock in the morning on a tuesday night I, I do enjoy it uh but i really like the free time in the summer as well so i didn't have, i'm not gonna lie i did not have that itch So, so what what's your golf game like? Are you are It's you not good. not good? It's Okay. I'm uh, I'm very consistent. I'm bad. I'm consistently not good. I you know what? I am a lefty. I have this kind of I call it a power fade off the tee, but it's other people call it other things. So uh, it's all over the map, but it's fun. And you know, some every now and again, I can light it up a little bit, but um, yeah, it's pretty. It's not. You know, I'm playing with players, guys. You know, who like to shoot high seventies, low eighties, and I'm more of a low nineties, high eighties guy. Is there anyone at Sportsnet that you played with that is like a really good golfer? Anyone that springs to mind? Um, there are Or any? some good golfers. I mean, Sean McKenzie hits it a mile. You know, Hmm. God, it's funny. Like, I played with him maybe six, seven years ago, and he was he was okay. And then, you know, he was like single guy, had all the time in the world, no kids. And then the next summer I played with him, I was like, oh, my God, you've gotten really good. And he's like, yeah, I've had some time. Uh, so he's quite a good golfer. Kevin Biaxa, no surprise there, you know, these pro athlete guys. Joel Darling, who's one of our executive producers at Hockey Night, he uh, – He has a membership here in Toronto, and he's a pretty good golfer. And just a couple of weeks ago, I got out with uh, Justin Bourne. And Mm. Justin, it's it. he's really nice off the tee, very straight, consistent, great iron. So I've only played once with Justin, and if first impressions mean anything, I'd say he's pretty good. So there's – and I'm forgetting some people. Some people are going to be, like, pissed that I didn't say, what about me? I played with you. I'm pretty good. Uh, there's a lot of pretty decent players. Rob Corte, who's a senior exec, uh, I should mention him, I guess. But he's a pretty good guy. He's taken some money off me on the course before. So there's a few uh, few guys out there who um, are pretty good at the network for sure. Okay, well, we're we're far away from golfing season for some of these teams, but I'm kind of curious for you, David, over the past 20, 30 years of you being in the industry, how have you seen maybe the change of the role as a host on a on a show like Hockey Night over the years? Um, that's interesting. Um, well, the whole landscape of broadcasting has evolved a lot, right? I mean, it used to be when I got into this business, it was just straight linear television. And then all of a sudden, you know, obviously with digital coming on strong, it's much more of an a la carte service. People don't want to be bogged down with a bunch of extraneous news and information they don't care about. They want to streamline it to exactly what they care about. So uh, in a way, you have to try and appease as many people or be specific in your audience as possible because people have a very short attention span and they'll be clicking away. I do think in general, though, like philosophically, I think the role of the host hasn't changed appreciably. Uh, the way I've learned it and I feel it is I'm surrounded by people who played the game, people who coached the game, managed the game, um, their level of expertise, their sophistication in the game, you know, their, their eye when they watch the game is different than the civilians like me. So I better put them in the position to really show what they know and not, you know, let your ego or anything else get in the way. I like to obviously direct the conversation, try and have as interesting and, in, in, you know, intelligent and debate and conversation as possible and obviously entertaining. Um, and at the same time, kind of put out like, well, what about this? What's going wrong here? Or what about this player? Or what should this team be doing? Or what adjustments need to be made here? And let them have their say and debate it out and hash it out and, and kind of just play traffic cop accordingly. And I don't think, you know, I, I definitely feel there's a place to interject my own personal opinions and thoughts on things. Um, but I think you have to pick and choose the spots that make most sense and recognize that, you know, in this setting, when I'm on the desk with, 
you know, whether it's, you know, Kelly Rudy or, or Kevin BX or whomever, these guys have played the game. They understand the game um, on a, on a level far greater than I will ever appreciate. And um, well, I do appreciate it, but um, you know, I think we have to just make sure to put them in the best position to really show what they know and, and showcase that. And I, I think that is sort of what can lead to a successful show generally. I'm, I'm kind of curious. And you just touched upon it. In fact, of about the role of the host where you want to interject, maybe a little bit of your opinion or just maybe a tidbit. What's that like for you where you have the itch to almost have an opinion sometimes? Do you hold it back? What's that like for you, David? Um, I think you pick your spots, but you know, and I, I will, I have an uneducated opinion on some things and I have an educated opinion on some things. For example, just the last show, we we're having a debate on how invested should teams be in goaltenders. We've just seen what uh, Swayman, Allmark, I'm forgetting a couple, uh, uh, Ottinger. We've seen a bunch of guys sign these large $8 million plus dollar deals. And we came up with, a, you know, like, is this a good move for teams to be in a salary cap era to be investing that kind of money in goaltenders that you look at as elite goaltenders, but they're not necessarily going to be a guaranteed championship mm -hmm. uh, team. You know, uh, it, it was with the backdrop of, you know, what are the Rangers going to pay um, Shesterkin? And and I remember we were kind of debating it out, and and it was Sam Cosentino and Luke Gazdick and Jennifer Botterill, and I think they were all kind of in agreement, like, yeah, you got to pay the goalies. That's the center of your team, da da da. And I kind of made the counterpoint. I said, well, if you look at the last, you know, X amount of years of Stanley Cup winners, Aiden Hill, Matt Murray, you know, Bennington, these are guys. They weren't making eight million dollars. I mean, those are kind of flat, not flash in the pans, but they kind of came out of mm -hmm. seemingly nowhere and led a team to the Stanley yeah. Cup championship. And you don't necessarily need to spend, you know, eight plus million dollars to guarantee you a spot in the Stanley Cup final. So we we had a nice debate. I definitely feel like I need to encourage conversation and um, and when I can add value to the conversation, I'll, I'll certainly feel comfortable to do that. How much of that maybe for you is trying to think about conversations daily, like as a host um, is like in your mind, are you up at, you know, 11 PM on a Tuesday thinking like, what do the Leafs need to do with their third line center? Like, what's that like for you trying to find different conversations to, to have on the show? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's a collaboration. It's not me saying, what are we mm -hmm. going to do? We have, you know, producers we work with, the other analysts certainly have a say. We have show meetings. And I do, I do look at it through that lens, though. I do. I'm like, what would be interesting, right? And, you know, talking about the third line of a team isn't always going to be the sexiest or most important thing. Um, I, I think you got to find things where if guys are sitting around, you know, drinking a beer, watching the game, what would they be talking about? I can't believe they're starting this goal here. I can't believe, you know, this player is not playing, you know, is healthy scratch for this player or, or whatever the big storylines are. Mm -hmm. Or I can't believe this guy's on the power play or etc. So you do try and get in the minds of the viewers and kind of answer those questions that they might be having at home and give mm -hmm. them that extra value added there. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm often thinking about it for our Wednesday show this week, we have uh, Washington and Philadelphia and I won't spoil anything, but there's certain, you know, there's certain obvious storylines when you look at Washington and Philly, Philly and there's certain line, storylines that are a little bit more buried and it's like, okay, um, what are some of those other storylines that we could bring to the surface and really attack and have the strengths of our analysts to, to really engage in those conversations. So that's always the key. I'm, I'm always curious for, for as a host, because, you know, you're doing TV, you need to go to an ad break. How adept do you have to become at almost <laughs> rerouting a conversation to end and how difficult is that? And how long did that maybe take for you after years on the job to, to feel more comfortable at it? That's a, a really good question, because that is one of the more difficult things, I'd say, of being a host and something that's largely forgotten is, is transitioning in and out of conversation, whether it's from conversation to conversation, we have to segue or find a way to get from you're talking about this team's power play to talking about the other team's you know losing streak. Like, well, how do you get from one to the other or whatever? Um, and, and going to break and coming out of break are, are key things for hosts. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, it's not always easy because you have a producer in your ear saying, you know, wrap it up, you know, 10 seconds, got to go, like we're done. And, um, and you know, someone's in the middle of a thought and you want to, you need to get to commercial. I mean, it's it's an, a have to happen situation, especially at the top of the hour. So if we have a 6.30 p.m. Eastern pregame and the, and the puck drops 7.07 and we know we have to come up at 7 o'clock, we can't be coming up at 7.01 or 7.01.30 or whatever we have to have a hard out if we have three minutes of commercials at 657. So that mm -hmm. being the case, 
it's fairly firm. Uh, thankfully, I work with really good analysts. They're, they, I think they appreciate when they have to sort of speed things up. What's hard for them is to have to get their thoughts, you know, edited in their head on the fly. They might have a 45 second thought on, on should William Nylander play center or wing? And suddenly the producers in the air saying, we've got 15 seconds and they've got to condense that down in an articulate and, and sensible way. And then I have to transition from them and get us physically to the commercial. And it doesn't have to be perfect. I, I think earlier in my career, I'd be, you know, Alice, I'd be like, oh God, it was two seconds. Like, and now it's like, look, if they're running a bit of, of, of the, we call it the bumper, if they're running the video and my voice trails a little bit. And even if it's cut off a little bit at the end or, or, you know, we're just kind of having this cross talk and we're going to commercial people at home, I think, understand that it should be organic. It should feel natural. It doesn't have to be as compartmentalized as that. But um, but that is something that takes a little bit of getting used to, for sure. What do you think makes it organic in terms of a conversation where you have, let's say, four minutes? Like how, what, for you, how do you try to like, obviously, you want to get to everyone, but how can you make a 45 second blurb by Sam Constantine or whoever? you know, hmm. exciting for a viewer while also making sense and then having a real conversation. Like what's yeah. that that goes into that? I mean, I really think the key Alex is, is you're talking about things that people are interested in and are passionate about and have strong opinions on. It's got to be genuine. I mean, the, the viewers at home are so sophisticated, right? It's not about just stirring up something for the sake of stirring up something. It's got to be something where someone says, you know, I'm really interested, you know, Whatever the topic is, you know, off the top of my head, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm looking at my little my little notes. I'm putting my games together for our show. So I have a show tomorrow with all 32 teams are playing. So we're talking about Vancouver. Let's say we said, all right, Vancouver, two one and two points in four out of five games. But what's going on with Pedersen? Right, just two assists. He's barely had any shots on goal. What's going on with Pedersen? You really hope you're getting into a conversation where some of the analysts have strong opinions. Well, here's what I think is going wrong with Pedersen right now. Or I'm not worried about Pedersen because I know he's doing this right. He's doing that right. And Rick Tockett likes his defensive game and both, whatever their point is. Um, but there's a passion, there's an interest. Uh, and then it organically will flow and you'll be surprised at how quickly four minutes, even though, you know, it seems like a long time to talk about something when you're on television and you have people who have strong opinions and they're able to back it up with facts and context and you're having rebuttals and everything else, it, it flies by. So to me, that's what makes a good conversation. We have strong opinions. You can have strong debate um, and, and people are kind of pa passionate or interested in it to a level where it's not being a forced conversation. Um, I want to go from a forced conversation to maybe the conversation we always have in Toronto is about, uh, is it the year? Will this core break through <laughs> and make it to the playoffs? I guess for you, you know, to put a bit of maybe your, your opinionated hat on, David, mm -hmm. um, you know, it seems as though Craig Berube is coaching in a very different manner than maybe Sheldon Keefe and even Mike Babcock years ago is with this team, you know, calling timeouts when they're up 5-2, just like things, little things like that, being hard on their team. Uh, I think there's no music, not that I don't think that matters at practice, but that's a nice little tidbit. But just for, for you, David, what what have you seen through this from this team so far this season? And, and why do you think maybe it can be different or maybe the same story as, as years prior? Well, it's early returns, so let's keep a measured approach. But I, I really like the fact you brought up um, that LA Kings game completely in control over the Kings. And then Craig Berube noticed they're going back to some of their old habits. Hey, we're, we have a comfortable lead. We're not going to play north-south. We're not going to make the safe play. We're going to make the fun play that could have potentially lead to a goal, but also could potentially lead to disaster. And he calls a timeout. And one thing that I noticed uh, is he just, he, he went at it pretty hard considering it's in October, it's a home game. You have a three goal lead and it was your star players who you didn't like the way they were playing. That's that last shift. Uh, that is maybe a difference we're going to see. Craig Berube, uh, you know, unlike uh, past coaches, and that's not to knock on them, but I think maybe he feels he's won a cup. He has a bit more of a leash to just be himself. You know, Sheldon Keefe did an incredible job in Toronto by most accounts, um, but it was also his first time as a head coach in the NHL. Uh, Craig Berube not only, you know, played whatever, 15 seasons or 18 seasons or whatever it was in the NHL, um, but he also has coached a Stanley Cup winner. He comes here with a certain amount of pedigree and and equity built up that I think he probably feels I'm gonna uh, this is the style I go by and it's a no nonsense style. Um, as far as the Leafs prospects for this year, it's far too early to to say. Uh, they're an incredibly difficult division. Um, but the early returns on Stolars, on OEL, on Tanev, on Craig Barube, 
are quite good. I mean, it looks like the style of play and they might give up, you know, it doesn't look like Austin Matthews is probably going to score 69 goals this year. He might, but he might not. And it won't matter if he scores 50 goals and the team gets to the conference final or gets to the Stanley cup final. If they get into a style of play, that's more, um, you know, uh, conducive to winning in the postseason, and it becomes their norm and not like, okay, it's the playoffs. We got to switch. Uh, we got to switch, a, a, you know, hit a switch that isn't, isn't really possible after 82 mm -hmm. games of playing a different style. So the personnel is a little different. The style seems a little bit different. The approach seems a little bit different. And, um, you know, the early returns certainly are good. You know, the Leafs, I look at them as a, in a bucket of six, seven, eight other teams, Stanley Cup contenders. And it wouldn't shock me if you were to run through whoever those eight teams are in my mind. You know, there's the Dallas's, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, you know, Edmonton, obviously. If you run through those eight teams, any of them win a Stanley Cup, I won't be shocked. And I put the Leafs in that bunch of teams, but it takes a lot, as you know, to run through four series. And we've, we've seen the roadblock um, in Toronto after the first round or during the first round, um, you know, for, for a foreseeable amount of time. So uh, this might be the right group, but uh, I guess time will tell. How much do you think just generally uh, does coaching have an impact on, on teams? Obviously, you know, they get paid big bucks to have an impact, but sometimes it feels as though, you know, one coach comes in, the other coach comes in, same results or vastly different results, but maybe a different group of players. Like how much impact do you think coaching has on winning in the NHL? Well, what's the old saying? You know, you show me a good goaltender and I'll show you a good coach. I mean, a great coach, I don't care if you stick John Cooper with the worst team, he's not going to win the Stanley Cup. Um, he might get the most out of that team and, and help build them up the way he did with Tampa. But you have to have great players. And you talk to coaches, they'll tell you that, you know, like, I need great players. Uh, I do love the approach, though, uh, of John Cooper. Uh, Spencer Carberry in Washington is, you know, his what he was able to do to lead that team last year to the playoffs. They're off to a nice start this year. Um, you know, maybe he's someone to keep an eye on with their approach. Peter DeBoer has had great success. Peter Laviolette. There's a number of guys in the league you think somehow are able to squeeze the most out of their respective teams. And I've listened, I, I missed a whole bunch of guys who have obviously done really well. Um, I, I do think coaching plays – a role to a degree uh, as it does in any sport, but at the end of the day, it's really incumbent on the players. Um, I think the messaging is key uh, to try and get the players both motivated and also feeling confident. I, I think what you need for a good coach now, maybe Alex used to be a disciplinary it used to be just a bang the fist on the table and threaten this guy and yell at that guy that used to work. You know, as someone who has two teenagers, that doesn't work, right? Like it needs to be, now, it needs to be um, high EQ. What motivates Bobby won't necessarily motivate Jimmy, right? And what really gets the best out of this guy won't might not get the best out of that guy. So you need to know your messaging might be different with all 20 guys. And, and mm -hmm. coaches, the best coaches I see are the guys who are able to understand their team and how the players individually think, what motivates them, what drives them, and how hard they can be pushed at certain times when you got to put the arm around them and say, don't worry about it. And certain times when you kick them in the butt and be like, come on, man, we need more from you. Um, so I, I think that's the key to good coaching. And I think those types of cerebral, smart coaches are the ones that are, we're going to see more and more of getting integrated into the NHL in the next few years. Yeah, no, for sure. That's really interesting. And th there does seem to be a bit more young hires in the NHL after, you know, the the joke that it's always the, the carousel of coaches, right, where it's just one coach gets fired and goes around. It seems like there's a bit more new blood. Um, and one of those guys maybe to transition to the Oilers was um, with their coach as well. And um, last year, you know, after uh, Chris Lombard, yeah. yeah, after Jay Woodcroft got fired, obviously a poor start. They've had a poor start this year as well after making the cup final in Edmonton. Um, I guess for you, I know it's super early, but um, this is how worried should Oilers fans be? Is it just... <laughs> Like you do have Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl, I I still think it's uh, I bet good money if I could that this team will make the the playoffs. But is there something that you think maybe the start of the season that might impact how you see this team as a cup contender, or just what do you think um, about this team? Um, I don't want to compare this year to last year because last year I think there was I wouldn't say legitimate panic, but there was you know it had been twelve games right now there's six games in at, at this time of the taping here so. Uh, I'm not nearly as worried. Um, now, granted, people forget last year to dig themselves out of that hole. They had a franchise record 16-game winning streak. I don't think this group, you know, they're certainly capable of it. You certainly don't want to have to have a 16-game winning streak. 
I'm not worried about the Oilers. I would say there's some tweaking to take place. Um, listen, it's been a slow start for Hyman, for Arvidsson. Um, you know, Skinner's feeling his way into this lineup. Uh, it's a new feel to it. Um, there's probably a little bit of that Stanley Cup hangover, you know, that very first game when they got the doors blown off by Winnipeg 6 nothing. You know, I was like, uh-oh, what, you know, that's a strange way to start the season if you're the Edmonton Oilers. Um, but am I worried? No. I, I think there'll be some tweaking. They're figuring out their blue line. Um, they didn't lose their nucleus. They lost, you know, Cody CC and DeHarnay, uh, Broberg, but they lost some important pieces on the blue line specifically. So now they have to feel their way. Like, how is this blue line going to go moving forward? Who's going to take those important minutes? Um, do we need to add something to to just elevate the depth and talent on our blue line? And I think those are questions that, you know, will get answered in the next few months. Above and beyond that, you know, Stuart Skinner got off to a tough start. And um, when he got off to, you know, last year, I guess it was Jack Campbell and Skinner got off to a bad start. Um, but then he corrected himself. And we saw how good Stuart Skinner at his best can be. He can be a world-class goaltender. He was a big reason the, the Oilers came within one game of winning the Stanley Cup final. So um, I imagine Stuart Skinner is going to get more consistent and feel better moving forward. And, you know, quite frankly, McDavid and Dreisaitl and some of their the superstars haven't, you know, been as super as we had seen in previous years just yet. Are, are my concerned about that? Absolutely not. What was your reaction to seeing McDavid in the the – the documentary, uh, you know, lose it and get after game two of the Stanley Cup finals. Uh, I mean, I loved it. I, you know, Connor McDavid, this is what he was built to do. This is what he cares about. He's so passionate. You imagine he's passionate like that, but you know, when he deals with the media, he's often very cerebral, very monotone, very controlled. It was good to get a glimpse behind the velvet curtain and go, wow, the passion that's there is immense and the competitiveness is through the roof. And, you know, McDavid's like Michael Jordan, uh, Tiger Woods, like Wayne Gretzky, like the, the compete level is is nuts. You know, like you see that in guys like Sidney Grosby and Nathan McKinnon. So I'm not surprised at all. And he felt, you know, they were the, saw the Stanley Cup final slipping away. I believe that was, was that during game two? Is that what it was? I think or it was after, after game two. Yeah. Uh, when they went down. They, to yeah. They had just lost two games. Game two was not a good game for the team at all. Um, you know, and he wanted to send a message loud and clear. You just don't know what McDavid's been in the league, what, eight, nine years drafted in 2015. So it's been in the league a long time and you don't know when you're getting to the Stanley Cup final. It's taking this long just to get to the final. And he's like, we're not just going to let this slip through our hands here. Right. So I love to see it. I think the documentary has been great. I've only watched uh, the first couple of episodes, to be honest with you. Uh, but I think it's nice to humanize the players, show them in a different light and really sort of in, in McDavid's case, really just show the passion and love and desire that's there. Is there any player around the league, you know, you've, you've, met a bunch you've been in the, the hockey world for a long time that you'd really want to be on a to see in a documentary setting oh wow i mean there's a lot of guys um wow that's a great question um you mean like their home life and what they're like yeah their like similar to the documentary it doesn't have to be yeah. but just almost like willie nylander or pasternak like yeah on the i mean tom wilson you know, Brad Marchand, I'm not sure if they're going to do something on Brad Marchand. Brad Marchand's an interesting guy, Tom Wilson. Like, the guys who on the ice are just like, you're like, oh, my God, the guy's a maniac out there. He's a psycho. He's doing all these crazy things, and he's so good at what he does. And he's, but he's got this, like, he's like a bit of a, you know, lose it kind of guy. Yeah. To see those guys in their home setting when they're the most calm, cool, collected guys. One thing about working with the analysts, I've worked with a lot of, you know, quote, unquote, the, like, enforcer tough guys. You know, like, I work currently with Luke Gazdick. I've worked with... Uh, um kelly chase before uh there's been a number of you know paul bissonette obviously was you know a pretty tough guy in his own right there's been a number of guys um i'm forgetting a few but uh who i've worked with and they're generally the most gentle kind guys like off the ice and you're like wow you're an absolute maniac when you played and then you're totally chill dude here in the studio and it's actually really cool to see so i mean bxa i mean you saw bxa can snap certainly on the ice as quickly as anyone and yet he's just a, a funny charming you know kind of guy so uh to see some of those guys behind the scenes i think would probably shed a different light on what they're like and you even see some of them. i mean you're you're looking now on um, george peros right with the head of player safety some of these guys are going wow 
you know, they were such tough guys, but they're super smart, super engaging, often very funny. Um, so I think those would be the kind of guys that Amazon, I'm hopeful that they kind of shed some spotlight on some of those players because I think they're interesting dichotomy between their on ice persona and how they are away from the rink. The, the one guy just being here in Ottawa that has a really great persona uh, on the ice, off the ice, everywhere is lined. It's all Mark in, here in Ottawa, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, make, talking about uh, this Senators team as if uh, they were farming, t like uh, making um, kind of farming references to the. Mm -hmm. the uh, cows coming to 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 lay bare early in, in the in the springtime um with the season coming about i'm i'm just curious for you watching from afar with the senator seem like how much maybe of the crux of their issues over past years has been goaltending and how much do you think if this team is able to take it to the next level that it will be you know as much as any goalie is uh impactful on winning that the sens get good goaltending they make the playoffs if not, or is there maybe some more flaws in this team as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're a perfect team, but I mean, even last year with even average goaltending, they were a playoff team. I mean, they had league worst goaltending. It's hard to win, you know, with a 892 or whatever it was. I mean, they had the lowest save percentage of any team in the league. You're not going to, you're just not going to have success that way. It's impossible mm -hmm. to outscore that, that much trouble in your own end. Um, and it's not all on the goaltending. Certainly, I think their defensive play lacked. They certainly didn't insulate their goaltenders at all. Um, obviously, Elmark has to get healthy, but I do kind of like Toronto. I see some encouraging signs. Uh, I mean, certainly the offense is dynamic. We've seen that, and, you know, they've outscored their mistakes a couple of times this year. Uh, having said that, I do see a greater level of discipline and structure with the team. One thing that I like, I love the edge Brady Kachuk plays with. However, I don't want to see him taking 150 penalty minutes. I just think it's too much. And I don't want to see him taking every fight. I don't think he has to take every fight, even though he, he's beyond capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that what we're six, seven games in, whatever it is for the Senators, and he's, he's taken three minor penalties thus far. Um, I like him to play on that edge, on that line, but not always get over that line where he's having to, to be in the box for extended periods of time. So that's one thing. And I'm not sure if that's something the coaching staff has addressed with him, or if that's something just being a new dad is maybe brought to him or, or what um, I, I do like the early returns of, of, of what we're seeing. And I, I think we are seeing the emergence, you know, Jake Sanderson is going to be, oh, he's so good. He controls the ice. He plays so many minutes. He's so young. He skates so well. Um, I do like the fact they brought in three Stanley Cup winners, Amadio and Cousins and Perron. And I know it hasn't been the best of starts, you know, certainly offensively for David Perron. But I think by the end of the year, you'll see the value there. I feel Claude Giroux felt maybe like the elder statesman who had to carry all of that burden. And that's not a knock on Brady Kachuk. I think Brady Kachuk is an elite player and a good captain. But I think it's hard um, to, to sort of be that guy to say, well, guys, you don't know, you might be in this league for 15 years and we got to take it more seriously. And you're talking to a bunch of sort of 23, 24 year olds. Now you have some guys who've won the cup, who've been in the league a long time, who can speak through a different experience. So I think there's a better sort of overall group dynamic. Um, but again, if it comes back down to goaltending, you know, Allmark has to get healthy, be healthy and be the guy they're expecting um, to lead them and, and win them games in the sense of if things start going perfectly, he makes the timely save and he can kind of help correct things, stop, you know, a 30 second sequence in your zone, make the save, keep the rebound, reset, get new fresh legs out there and not get burned. Yeah, no, you said it perfectly. It's interesting that you talked about uh, kind of the elder state and that um, Steve Stavos was brought in with Cousins, Perron, and Audio because, uh, you know, last year I remember talking to Jacob Chikrin and he said, you know, it can't just be Giroud, the, the guy that we lean on. We need other leaders. And, well, yeah. Giroud was basically the only player over 30 on the team. And now they have insulated that core of Kachuk, Stutzla, Sanderson with guys. And I think, um, you know, Perron – as well, he's been really good with Shane Pinto, and their line defensively has been a really, really good through five games. So even though he's not scoring, they're not letting teams score on him. So that's that's obviously a bonus. But um, I think everything you said there hit the nail on the coffin. And if Allmark is that eight point two five goaltender, then mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe just maybe this team will make the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, the hardest, I, I picked them to make the playoffs. I think they have the personnel to make the playoffs. I think they now have maybe the structure to make the playoffs. The one big asterisk, you know, working against them is I think they're in this division that is, you know, if they were in the Metropolitan Division, 
you know, or the Pacific division, I, I would feel, you know, central is pretty tough too, but the Atlantic just has these four pretty elite teams. We keep waiting for Boston to drop off and listen, it's early. Maybe Boston will drop off, but it doesn't look like they're planning to anytime soon. You, you keep thinking maybe Tampa, no Sergachev, no Stamkos. They look different. They don't, you know, you got Hedman, you got Point, you've got Vasilevsky. They don't look like they're going anywhere. The Leafs clearly are, they have, you know, their vision set on winning the division and, and maybe making some real noise in the playoffs. So it's a tough, and then of course the defending Stanley Cup champs, right? I forgot about them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, it's a tough division, but I, I could conceivably see five teams from the Atlantic getting the playoffs. One of those five teams being the Ottawa Senators. Um, and let's face facts. This team's been a pretty good team. The second half of the last, the last second half of the last five years, they've been, a good enough team to make the playoffs. It's the first 20 to 30 games. They get sunk. You know, we put up a board on Saturday in our afternoon game. I was speaking to our producer and saying, we got to show how bad their starts have been the last five years. Oh. One year, two, two wins, first 15, four wins, first 20, uh, eight wins, first 20. You can't be staring and looking up and going, wow, we're, we're 10 points out of a playoff spot on November 1st. It's just, then you have to play, you know, 675 hockey the rest of the way. It's too, it's too tough. Um, so it's good that they're, you know, right now they have a winning record. And if they can kind of even just stay around 500, stay around 500 for the first, you know, month and a bit and get their feet under them, get everyone, you know, healthy and, and be in kind of good mental place to make that push. Yeah, no, for sure. And to transition from one rebuilding team to a, another in, in the Montreal Canadiens, I'm just kind of curious. They they had a good start, beat the Leafs in, in the first game of the season, beat the Sens as well. And they haven't beat any other team uh, mm -hmm. since then. Um, I'm just curious for you, obviously, as part of this rebuild, where do you see this team right now? Um, do you feel like they can be, you know, maybe a chippy team that can get close to a playoff spot? Are they ready for that with this young core? Just where do you see this team right now? You know, there's just a lot of question marks there, Alice. I, it's hard when they lose line A. They're one big offseason acquisition. They lose him for a few months in the preseason um, and then they were, they've been banged up or five games in six games in, and they're already a number of question marks and Gooley didn't travel with the team. And they're kind of going, Oh my goodness, what's going on here? You know, Slavkovsky is favoring his shoulder and uh, Matheson's taking maintenance days. And you're kind of going, wow, we're two weeks in the season and the team's pretty banged up. I, I don't view the Montreal Canadiens as a playoff team. And that's not a, a disparaging comment. I view them as a team with a lot of nucleus building blocks which are great like i said at the first game of the year i said i'm picking caulfield to score 40 goals this year be the first 40 goal scorer for montreal since Vinny damfus in 99 1994 nick suzuki 25 years of age all he's done is gotten better every year at all facets of his game he's like a selkie type guy down the road he's that good um you know this Lane Hudson is going to be a star. He's just got a bit of the Quinn Hughes, Adam Fox creativity and um, just how he moves the puck, just the poise he has at such a young age. Um, you know, obviously, Gooley's a great player. And then they have all this draft capital to work with, right? I think they have three firsts and three seconds or whatever it is. Like, they've stockpiled so many draft picks. Um, so they have some flexibility to move some of these picks, pick up some more bona fide players. Um, I don't look at this as a three more years of rebuild. I look at this as a year from now, we should be talking about Montreal the way we talk about Ottawa. Like the expectation next year for Montreal should be to make the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And they do have a really good young nucleus. And let's not forget about Montembeau. Montembeau's definitely working his way into this conversation of, will he be there at the Four Nations face-off representing yeah. Canada? You know, he's in that conversation with Bennington and Aiden Hill and Stuart Skinner and everyone else. So um, I like the nucleus. I just... I don't think they're there yet. I don't think they, you know, when, when you miss the playoffs, you know, by 27 points or something, you're not, even if you're five wins better, seven wins better, you're not going to make the playoffs. So they have, they still have a long way to go, um, but there should be a lot of optimism surrounding what is a good, interesting, you know, dynamic young team. I think one fan base that has been very optimistic has been the the Winnipeg Jets after a 5-0 and start to the year. How, how surprised were you just at their start and that they've been coming out of the gates just, guns blazing yeah a little bit um i mean i liked their team last year i thought they were gonna i thought they were gonna win their playoff series versus colorado i didn't think they were gonna implode losing five give up five plus goals every game um i think we see when they play the structured style the balance scoring i love the balance of their line i mean their third line with with larry and appleton i mean they have oh. as, as fierce a uh, grinding line as there is in the league um perfetti's gonna play a bigger role this year and and clearly, they, and they have Hellebuck, they have a Vesna 
winning goalie in that, a two-time winner, actually. So I, I'm, am I surprised they've started out the way they have? Yeah, I mean, I didn't expect them to kind of run the table mm-hmm. in their first five games, but I'm not surprised they're a good team. Uh, I thought, you know, they're a team maybe not going to fight necessarily for the division championship. I might be wrong. Maybe they will. Um, you know, but last year we we'll forget they, they had the fourth best record in the NHL they had 110 points. Uh, I remember arguing this, I think even on air with one of our analysts who said, I don't see Winnipeg as a playoff team. And I said, look, even if they are five wins fewer than a year ago, they'll probably still make the playoffs. That'd be a hundred point season. So, um, you know, I still look at them as a very tough team to play against. And I think they sort of have the more traditional setup of strong through the middle, strong in net. Um, you know, strong blue line, even though they, they did lose some parts, they have seem to have interchangeable parts and they're going to be a fierce team to play against. Um, thanks so much, David, for, for taking the time and doing this. I guess the, the last kind of fun question that we always end off and, and this, I'm not holding you against this if this doesn't come true, but right <laughs> now, maybe you're way, 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 way too early Stanley Cup prediction. What is that as we... Well, my preseason prediction, which was two weeks ago, so I'm just going to stop. I haven't abandoned it yet. I picked the Edmonton Oilers to beat the. Oh my God. I picked the Edmonton Oilers to beat the Toronto Maple Leafs in the final. Um, I just threw that out there into the universe to see what would happen with it. You know, listen, like I said before, the Rangers, Dallas, there's. I could rattle off seven or eight teams that I think are, if they won the cup, I would not be surprised or shocked in any fashion. Um, Edmonton, though, I will say. Um, you know, I just think they have the parts uh, and they've gotten this close to it. And we've often seen in the past, we saw this with Gretzky's team back in the in 81 or whatever it was, getting to the final and losing to New York in the following year, or I guess it was 83 in the following year, starting their big run of Stanley Cup championships. We've seen this many times in the past. I mean, Florida Panthers got to the final two years ago and then came back and won. Um, so I, I'm going to stick to Edmonton as my choice at this point. Don't hold me to it because <laughs> things do changed dramatically but um i would put them as the front runner uh but there are many 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 good teams that will have a say in this and i'm not a big salary cap guy I, you know I, I find it annoying that we have to spend so much time talking about the cap but one thing it does bring essentially is does bring a level of parity to these teams and that's what we're seeing right now so it's mm-hmm. it's pretty cool for 32 fan bases you know they're not all sitting there saying we're going to win the cup this year um, but there's a good number of them where their fan bases feel confident they can make the playoffs. And once we, once, and we've seen this before, um, when a team makes a playoffs, anything can happen. So, yeah, no, for sure. And I think, uh, you know, people at Sportsnet wouldn't be too upset if it was a end of, <laughs> uh, Toronto final. So, even it's though really I think the Senators, uh, I think I'd be fine with that finals. Uh, so, uh, hopefully, hopefully that happens. And that would be one heck of a finals Matthews versus McDavid. Oh, I can the storylines would be good. Yeah. Be great. Awesome. Is there anything just maybe at you know hockey night this year that maybe you want kind of to the plug for for listeners before I let you go? No, listen, I just I appreciate the viewership. Um, you know, we try to, and I know, you know, I'm based in Toronto. We hear it a lot, oh, Leafs, 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 or Toronto, Toronto, Toronto. Um, certainly I root very hard. You can ask any of the people I'm watching the games with the analysts. I root for all the seven Canadian teams. I'm Hopeful that this is the year. 1993 was a long, long, long time ago. And I'm hopeful this is the year a Canadian team can win the Stanley Cup. Um, and it's fun to watch. And I love the passion with which our viewers, um, you know, consume our programming and, and watch. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate that. We don't take the viewership for granted at all and really uh, appreciate people taking the time, letting us into their living rooms. Let's hope we have a fun, exciting year. I'm excited for Four Nations Face Off. It's kind of like a little... Stanley Cup in the middle of the season, you know, those dog days. So I think we'll have a really fun year. And again, thanks for watching. Awesome. Well, David, uh, I love, I love the show as always. And I'm excited to, for, you know, the four nations for the playoffs, just hopefully, as you said, my hope is all seven Canadian teams make the playoffs and then uh, there's a possibility. There's a possibility. Uh, well, we've got, actually, it's funny. So tomorrow night uh, we have all 16, uh, it's 32 teams, 16 games never in one day have all seven Canadian teams won a game. And it really? doesn't happen that often. Well, think it doesn't happen that often because often when all seven are playing, there's Canadian teams versus Canadian teams, but we've never seen it. So I'm wondering maybe tomorrow, maybe just maybe it'll be the first time ever. Um, seven is optimistic and would be a pretty cool story. Um, but if we can get to five, I think that's a pretty good, you know, gives good odds and certainly let's just see how the chips fall. But um, yeah, always, as always, thanks for having me on. I'll say do appreciate it. Thanks so much, David.